right? So what we're looking at today is floor plans and site plans. Uh, they're a crucial part of architecture and any students planning on doing environmental design will probably want to include floor plans or site plans, uh, particularly if it's your final folio project. So very, very important to get your head around this. Majority of this is going to be talking about that, those functionality considerations and the real purpose of a floor plan. So the practical implications of a floor plan and a site plan. We're going to start by going through the basics. So just the general parameters that you want to consider um, before you even start designing anything. Then we're gonna go through the planning stage. So roughly placing out items and creating the general shape and layout of the building. Then we're gonna look at the refinement stage. This part is often overlooked by students, is putting yourself in the shoes of the occupant uh, or the person experiencing your design and thinking about how they might move through the space, uh, where the doors need to go, how large areas need to be to ensure maximum enjoyment, things like that. Finally, we're gonna talk about finishing and presenting. So making sure that your design adheres to all of the necessary conventions so that your finished technical drawings can accurately be interpreted by specialists ensuring that those universal conventions are met. So let's get started. Step one is the basics. Uh, often overlooked, really, really important. You're gonna need to think about how big your site is going to be. In this case, the site's 15 metres wide by 10 metres deep. Um, you can see I've already started working on the correct conventions. The site has that chain line. Uh, the dimensioning lines are fine and I've done my measurements in millimetres without using the mm at the end. So all following those correct conventions. I'm working in Illustrator for this. I'm working at 100 to 1 or 1 to 100 scale. So basically every one centimetre equals a metre or every 10 millimetres equals a thousand millimetres. So that's your site plan. So pretty small site plan. Next. Uh, this is something that's overlooked as well, is start thinking about some of the features of the land. Um, students shy away from this because they find that it makes things too specific and it's, it's bringing up obstacles that I suppose they feel that they could probably just ignore. But the addition of these features creates design challenges to overcome and it makes your design more interesting and intriguing as you get to, the viewer gets to see what you've done to overcome the challenges of the features of that particular block. So we've added in a few trees. We've added in a road as well. Um, so that's really important. We're working on a residential block. So there's always gonna be a road and there's also a point of entry as well. That's always going to be prescribed with residential land. The council determines where that point of entry is. So always include that and you need to consider how that's going to influence the design. Throw in some other important features. So uh, on the left and the right hand side, we've got existing dwellings. So that's going to play a very, very important part because it impacts where different doors and windows are going to open out to because you've got privacy considerations as well. I've also thrown in a river at the bottom. That creates its own challenges, but it also provides opportunities for a view for people to look out onto something. So it provides that challenge of making sure that the windows of the important, most lived in areas face out towards the view. So create some interesting uh, thought processes there. Finally, we've got our title block. Uh, the main thing that you really care about with the title block at this stage is which way north is. Uh, in the Southern Hemisphere, northern facing aspects or orientation is really important. So, um, and I'm gonna explain that to you in the next slide, but determining where north is, is going to help you think about ways to make windows face north. Now, because north faces to the top right of the screen, um, there is gonna be some challenges there because it's also a small block, so you're not able to rotate the block specifically to just point north. So there's gonna be some challenges there which we're gonna look at overcoming. Now the reason in the Southern Hemisphere that Northern aspect is really good is because 
Summer is really hot, of course, and winter can be very cold, particularly in the south of Australia. So if you're looking at the, uh, the difference between where the sun rises and falls, in the summer it goes right overhead and it's a very, very harsh light. So it's an unwelcome summer sun. So facing north, because it goes right overhead from east to west, uh, those northern windows aren't gonna get beaten down by the sun. They're not gonna have direct sunlight coming through them. Whereas the winter sun, which sets a little bit north um, because it goes further up the equator in the winter, uh, throughout the day, that winter sun's gonna shine through those windows. And that's that welcome winter sun because it's cold and you want the sun to shine through. So that's a little bit of a, a quick diagram to help you understand that northern aspect and those considerations. Obviously, the building that I've used there is way, way, way too small, and we're gonna get into that now. Finally, with the basics, you want to drag on all of the different things that need to be included in the house. So often you'll see students um, start designing something and then remember, that they've completely forgotten the bathroom or that the kitchen's way too small or there's no living area or they've forgotten that it was supposed to have some car accommodation. So make sure you drag in all of those features at the very, very start because um, otherwise you're gonna forget about them and you're gonna make certain areas too big and you're gonna spend a lot of time tweaking to make things fit in, especially if you're working with a really small space like we're working in. So basically in this particular case, we're doing a two bedroom, one bathroom home with a garage. We've got a dining area, a lounge, a kitchen, and I'm doing an outdoor area as well to make use of that river. So, uh, so like a nice entertaining area. Step two, we're moving into planning now. So you've got everything there. Uh, a way to go about this, and it's not the definite way, but it's a really great way to start, is to push out the different items to roughly where they might sit in the diagram. So in the bottom left, we've got the bed, which will be the master bedroom. We want that to face out into the view. So I'll push that to the bottom left. We want our living area to look out onto the view. We want the entertaining area, so that barbecue. We want that looking out onto the view. Kitchen and dining, it's less important. And of course, we're putting the car exactly where it needs to be, so driving in from that driveway. So after we've done that, the next step is to roughly draw around those external walls. So we're starting to formulate the shape of this house and of course the outdoor area, making sure that you steer clear of the existing established trees, uh, making sure that um, you consider the garage and how everything's gonna fit together. Then of course, the obvious next step is to start drawing in those internal walls. So make sure when you're doing this, that you look up the standard sizes or at least the minimum sizes for the rooms. Uh, it's very, very common for students to make a bathroom that's way too small uh, or a kitchen. So I'm gonna guide you through some of those things now. First things first is the bedroom. You've gotta do them at a minimum of 2.5 by three meters. Uh, any smaller than that, and they're not gonna be able to fit a double bed. They might be a single bedroom, uh, which can sort of be a bit smaller than that, but you really want to try get that minimum of 2.5 by 3 metres. Um, another thing students commonly do is they'll push the bed into a corner. You can't do that. Beds need to, you need two people sleeping in the bed, generally speaking. Um, so both people need to access uh, a side of the bed each. So that's why you always want to try to make it so that you're positioning that bed in the center. Uh, secondly to that, you've got your bathrooms. Try to make them about two by three meters. So um, you want a nice amount of room around the toilet. You can see that bathroom there, that sink and basin's a little bit small. You've pl got plenty of room for bench tops, but we're gonna move into that. But two by three meters, a nice size. Also consider things like the towel rail um, as well. So you need some spare wall space on a bathroom too, so it can't be too cramped. You need to think about what the features are of a bathroom and what you're gonna need, where you're gonna hang things like towels, uh, perhaps storage as well. Lots of different things that you're gonna think about there. Lounge room, uh, there's no real maximum or minimum size prescribed, 
but probably three metres in depth is safe. That way you can have a couch which is far enough away from the television so that you're not kind of standing over the television. You might leave a little bit of room for a coffee table as well. Garage, the Australian standards for a garage, it needs to be three metres wide by 5.4 metres as an absolute minimum. So try to take into account that. The kitchen, lots of students uh, make the kitchen way, way too small. Always think about the amount of bench space. That's something that's often overlooked by students. They'll do the sink, the stove and the fridge, but there's no place for food preparation or any sort of breakfast bench or anything. So try to think about that. Also, if there's two benches like you can see here, make sure they're about a metre apart so that you can move between the benches comfortably. Dining area. Always make sure that you've got a dining table where you can pull the chairs out and safely move around the dining table when people are sitting there. You don't want to press it up against a wall or put it in a spot where you can't get to a chair. Uh, it seems really simple, but it's something that's really frequently overlooked. Now we've done that planning and we're going to go into re some refining. Now what I've added in already is a couple of different things. You can see at that entrance, I've added a bit of wall to kind of close off that entrance. So you kind of walk into an, an entryway. Uh, those other two yellow areas are some wardrobes. Um, another thing that's really, really frequently overlooked is storage space. Um, if you ask most people what they want more of in their home, they're always gonna say storage space. It's even overlooked by the best architects. Now I've put a little question mark there because we've laid this out, but there's a bit of an odd space where that question mark is. And this is where you really need to start thinking like an architect. We know we've got this really small block and spaces at a premium. What can we do to make use of that kind of random unused space? So what I've done here is this next stage in refining, I've slotted in a bunch of windows, I've added all of those doors, so we've got heaps and heaps of doors now. At this stage, you're moving on to those last moments of refinement. So you can see I've already done a bunch of shifting and shuffling because I found when you're adding the doors um, that things need to move, that things are in the way that you hadn't anticipated. Uh, I've put in some sliding doors there, um, which are adjacent perhaps to um, to swinging doors because you can't have two swinging doors that might bang into each other. I've added some windows, making sure that we've got these big nice windows that face uh, down towards the river. Um, and I've also added a little desk nook in that little question mark space so that that kind of turns into a, a little mini landing pad where you could perhaps store things, but maybe also have a laptop or a computer there that you can work off as kind of a little home office type scenario. Now, this is where we need to start doing some real heavy refining. So if we flick back, what I've done is I've noticed that there's, it's a little bit cramped in a few areas. So I've pushed the walls across a bit. So they're sort of impeding a bit with the trees. They'd still be hanging under an established tree. But what that's done is it really opened up some space and given me some opportunities for things like a linen closet and perhaps a pantry as well. So these are those really subtle changes which show that you're really finessing an idea. Now what I've done is I've put a bit of an angle to those windows. As I said, we want to try to make those windows face north. This is the best way to do it. When you start adding angles like this, it does complicate your design and create some awkward spaces. So that presents its own little challenges. But now we've got some windows which face to that beautiful northerly sun and also don't face directly out onto the road. Uh, finally, or another thing that I've done is I've pushed that uh, southern, south, south side wall up a little bit. And what that's done is it's allowed the outdoor area to kind of wrap around all of the way through to the bedroom. So we're starting to think now about that livability. How nice would it be in the master bedroom if you could just slide that door open and sit overlooking the river outside. So that's those sort of final nuances. Um, little thing that I've noticed, so that we've got a little question mark there, and this is what you're gonna write about in your annotations as you're going through that refinement process. 
We've got those windows facing north, but that kitchen window now kind of faces directly onto the garage. So what are we gonna do about it? We're gonna shuffle that garage forward now so that kitchen window can now look and get some of that northern light that uh, is the whole reason behind it. Now, this stage is our step four and it's finishing. So I've taken away the site plan because this is a floor plan now. Um, so I've removed all of the other things to distract from the floor plan and I've started dimensioning. Now the dimensions are for two different reasons. First one's for the clients. They're gonna to wanna to see how large the bedrooms are, how large the spaces are, uh, how large the bathroom is, um, all of those different things so that they can make decisions on what they like and what they might like to change. So that's for that client feedback. Secondly, this technical drawing is very important for a builder. They'd be able to look at these, get those dimensions and start ordering the materials required to produce this building. So lots and lots of dimensions here. With your dimensions, you don't need to dimension absolutely everything, although you can if you want. Try to at least dimension the basics. So make sure that every room has corresponding dimensions. Um, Try to also consider, I've included the window dimensions as well, because I thought the window dimensions were quite important. But at the very least, try to make sure every room is dimensioned. General rule of thumb, I'm not gonna get too technical with this, but the bigger dimensions go to the outside and the smaller dimensions go to the inside. So see how those smaller dimensions are closest to the house and they get larger as they go out and more broad in their nature. The second thing is finishing um, the site plan. So over here, we've got the floor plan, which is great for the client, great for the builders. The site plan is imperative for things like council approval. The council needs to approve this new building. So they need to see where those windows are going to face, how much of the block does the, how much of the building, the block does the building take up? Um, are there any privacy issues? Do the windows look directly onto existing dwellings? Um, how close is the building to the street front? Um, how close is it to the rear of the property? Um, does it interfere with any established trees? They might have some heritage trees. So council planning is one of the main reasons that you do a site plan. It's also important for the client to see and really contextualize how that building's going to sit. So that's effectively it. So we've uh, produced a finished set of floor plans and a site plan, uh, which responds really well to the environment and um, is quite sophisticated in its design and architectural thinking. So it really, really takes into account lots and lots of different variables and it's a very well resolved design. There's a lot more places you can take it from here, but I hope that this will get you to a place where as you're designing those floor plans, you're really thinking about those practical and functional considerations so that you can design something which is genuinely livable in a real world sense. Thank you very much and I'm super keen to see what you come up with.